This is part five on Philippians three eighteen to 21. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. And last time I said we wanted to try to figure out in what sense they were enemies of the cross and who they were. And to open up the possibilities, I argued that the design of the cross, the purpose and aims of the cross are at least twofold. One is as a way of atonement, that is, how our sins are covered, how to get right with God, even though we are unworthy. And the cross is the answer. By the blood of the cross, we are justified. Or as it says in Colossians 2.14, on the cross, our, our uh, record of debt was nailed through the hand of Christ to the cross. So that's one way that the cross is designed to accomplish great things for us. It is an atonement. So you could become an enemy of the cross by proposing another way of atonement and saying that's not the only one or the true one. Or you could say that the cross of Christ represents a a way of life. He was showing us by the cross how we ought to deny ourselves and how we ought to take up our cross and, and follow him. And so the cross is a cross life. I am crucified with Christ. Paul says. So, which is it? That's what we want to try to answer in this, in this session. So, Father, we, we want not to be enemies of your cross. Oh, how we want to be friends of the cross, welcoming the cross. We want the cross to have its fullest possible effect in our lives, both dealing with our guilt and in providing a way of of new kingdom life in this world so common and show us now who these folks are who are enemies of the cross and how they are enemies. I pray in Jesus' name. Now, there are two possibilities uh, and and there are um, texts in Philippians that point in uh, both directions. What are we to make of this? So let's try the, the way of atonement first. So let's go to Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, and see if we can identify these people. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And we argued that this mutilation of the flesh is Paul's negative way of describing their practice of circumcision because it has been stripped of its uh, reliance upon Christ the Holy Spirit, and it's glorying in Christ. So he says, we are the circumcision. So these folks, whoever they are, are using circumcision in a way that is inappropriate and results in mere mutilation. So they seem to be uh, Jewish people who are claiming to do it the right way. And Paul is saying, no, we Christians are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in in the flesh. So he seems to be opposing people who are uh, confident that they will have a, have a, presence with the Messiah and be saved and be with God in the kingdom by their works of the flesh, which would be summed up here in circumcision. And if we keep going, we see that's exactly the way he argues. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. So he's not going to put any confidence in the flesh, though he could if he would. And the way he argues about the flesh, it's all uh, religious rigor, right? If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, oh, a Pharisee, I'm 
a super law keeper. As to zeal in keeping the law, I persecuted the people I thought were ruining the law. As to righteousness in the law, I was blameless. This entire way of arguing here sounds like these people who are mutilating the flesh in their circumcision are people who are boasting like this. And Paul's saying, look, it'll never work to depend on these things. And if it did work, I could beat you. But, and then he goes on to say, it's all rubbish. So this, this text here seems to suggest that to be an enemy of the cross is to be one who depends on works of the flesh for our confidence before God. Paul confirms this again in the next verses 8 and 9 of chapter 3. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. So all of that law-keeping as a way of getting confidence before God is loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And here's the, here's the, the nub of the matter. I want to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own. Now, that's an alternative way of having confidence before God, having a righteousness of your own that comes from law-keeping, which he's just renounced. But evidently, the adversaries haven't renounced. But that which comes through faith in Christ, this is the way you tap in to the achievement of Christ on the cross. You trust him, and thus you have a righteousness from God that depends on faith. So it seems to me that Paul is saying, well, it looks like these folks are enemies of the cross in that they are promoting circumcision and other kinds of uh, rigor of law keeping as a way of having, gaining confidence before God instead of relying on the cross of Christ for our righteousness. Now, what about the cross as a design for living? Is that also something he sees the adversaries doing? Let's take uh, the next verses, 3 9 to 11. I want to be found in him, Paul said, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So I'm going to trust him and his cross for the gift of righteousness as a solution for my guilt problem. But look at this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, may know the fellowship of his sufferings. So this is the cross shaping Paul's way of living. I want the cross to be the definition of how I live. I want to share his sufferings. I want to become like him in his death. So the cross of Christ is a model for Paul's life as he seeks to walk in a path of self-denial in the service of others for the glory of Christ, that if any means possible, he might attain the resurrection of the dead. So it's not merely that the cross or the death of Jesus on the cross is the way of atonement into life. It is a way of life after the atonement for how to live. Or here it is most clearly back in chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This mindset, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So the cross is the epitome of the mindset that he wants us to have. This is a way of life. This is not just a way of getting right with God through the atonement. This is a way, having been justified, having been accepted by Jesus, having our sin problem solved because of its guilt laid on Jesus, now we have a mind that is like Jesus, and he defines the mind as having a life conformed to the 
self-denying, condescending servant heart of Jesus, which climaxes on the pain and ignominy of, of the cross. So the question then is, are they enemies of the cross? because they are opposing the cross as a way of atonement by elevating circumcision and law-keeping as an alternative way of getting a righteousness from God? Or are they opposing the cross as a, a lifestyle that has their God as their belly, glorying in their shame with minds set on earthly things? In other words, they are undermining the cross as a way of self-denying service of others while they indulge themselves in this world. And the, the problem is that if this is the case, then who are the people in chapter 3 that seem to be so legalistic? That's what we're going to tackle next time.